Hi everybody, Tom Chapman here and back with another map tool tutorial video. This video actually marks a new series that I'm going to do and I'm going to separate it out from what I previously did. This series will be specifically on macros within map tool itself. And the reason I'm going to do this is because um, macros are such a big part of what map tool is that it needs its own separate series. So I'm still going to go back and maybe add a few more videos to the actual map tool tutorial, but uh, I'm also going to have a number of videos on macros. Before we get started, first, a couple of things. One, I am not a computer programmer. I am a teacher that is a semi-professional musician in grad school for music education that plays tabletop games in my free time. I will refer to aspects of code by the wrong name, and some of my code will be ugly to look at. So just know that as we get into it. Second, as with my first series on map to itself, this is very sequential and will start very easy and work to a more complex level. If you have something you would like me to touch on in later videos, please let me know in the comments below. Uh, for very complex requests, I would encourage you to seek out assistance on the RP Tools forums where people with way more experience than me can help you. Now just a heads up, this first video is just an introduction to macros and deals very little at all with coding. Uh, that will begin in the next video, but that being said, let's begin. So to start, what is a macro? Well within map tool I like to think of macros as buttons that you create to fill with code that execute things as simple as a d20 roll to as complicated as creating a character. It all depends on how much time you want to spend putting them together. I use them in all sorts of ways as shortcuts for gameplay and prep. Now one big resource that I've included in the uh, description below is a link to a document titled Introduction to Macro Writing. And this is part of an entire website dedicated to coding and macro writing within Map Tool itself. So I highly encourage you to check that out. There's a bunch of stuff in there that it, if you're curious, it'll have everything that you need to know. Now, to start, let's start off with a few uh, samples of what macros can do. So here we are, I'm looking at my map tool uh, instance where I've got my Numenera and map tool tutorial, and I've got a number of different macros as you can see, and I'm going to start over here on the far right where I have these die rolls public. The first thing and the most simple thing that you could do is just make a generic die roll. I have a number set up here, uh, common dice from D2 to D100, but this can go even further. This number after the D could be any number you want it to be. It could be even a D67 if you have a prime number in there for some reason. Now, the way these work is all I have to do is click on the macro. So I'll click here on the D2 and the macro goes about its business inside and spits out this in the chat. So for example, I rolled the D2, I click my D2, and it says, I roll a D2, fill the wrath of my one. And each time I click this, it'll do it again. Maybe at some point, there it is, it came up with a two. And I have this all the way up to D100, where if I click on it, I get, I roll a D100, fill the wrath of my 77. And it just picks a random number between one and 100. Now, some systems require multiple die rolls of the same type of die. For example, let's say you're a sorcerer in Pathfinder at level 10 casting a fireball. So that means you need to roll 10d6. So I click on multiple d6. For my value for times, I write in 10 because I need 10d6. Okay. And it spits this out. I roll 10d6s. The total is 37. I also use my macros as random generators, whether I need them on the fly or when I'm prepping to uh, put together an adventure. So if we look here at my campaign column, let's start with uh, what I use a lot, this cipher generator down here under Numenera. Now in Numenera, ciphers are found all over the place and there's a ton of different books in, that have ciphers littered throughout them. I think at this point I have six, six different books that I pick from and that makes, you know, writing them down, picking them, figuring out what book they're located in very difficult. So what I've done is I've made this macro that randomly generates a cipher and when I click it, it spits this out. You randomly generate the following cipher and everything in purple is the cipher itself. Now what's cool about this is this macro calls on this table right here the cipher table, and I'm going to open it. And if I scroll down, you can see that I'm rolling on uh, to pick from 629 different ciphers. 
So I use this to save time. It cost me a lot of time up front typing all of this into the program, but now that I have it, I really appreciate how easy it is to use. Monty Cook Games just came out with, uh, or recently came out with their Jade Colossus, which included a mapping engine. And I really like the mapping engine, but again, like ciphers, there's a lot in it. And sometimes I just want to be able to go, I need to make this map right now, and I don't want to have to get the book out and write things down and, and transfer it over that way. I want it right here. So I've put that entire engine into my Numenera mapping. So I can click on main feature, and it says, oh, I... Uh, I've come upon a chamber, so I click on chamber, and it tells me everything I need to know about this chamber. Now, I also have other things on here, but I'm not going to get into that. But just to say the least, I use these macros all the time when I'm running games in the Cypher system. Now to demonstrate something a little more complex. I'm going to select this little hero token. Now you see I have one macro on this hero, and I'm going to click on it, this attack and it's gonna pull up this menu. So this is where it gets a little more complicated because I'm gonna say, all right, what's my attack bonus? Let's say I'm, I don't know, I'm in, in 3.5 or Pathfinder. I think fifth edition kind of runs this way too. So my attack bonus, let's say is five. My target's AC is 15. Uh, I'm swinging a great ax, so I'm dealing 1d12. And what is my damage modifier? I'm kind of big and beefy, so my damage modifier is a six. And I click OK. And it spits this out, a valiant effort, but my seven was not enough to hit my target. So it took all that information and put it together, randomly generated one D20 roll, and then told me, yeah, this is what you come up with. Now, if I do it again, let's just make it easy. Whoops. Let's just make it easy and click, and I'll just fill it with five. So I'm likely to hit and I'll go, okay. I attack the darkness, a mighty swing. I hit with a 14 and I deal nine damage. And I've also got this set up so that if I rolled a 20, it would tell me I got a critical hit or a one is a critical fumble. So I'm gonna come in here, change one line of code. And when I click attack, uh, it doesn't matter. So I'll hit okay. Ouch, a critical fumble I've missed completely. And if I go back in and default this to come up with a natural 20, which is a critical hit, I click it again. And, excellent, a critical hit on a natural 20, I deal two critical damage, which includes the multiplier. So, that's just an idea of what these macros can accomplish. Next, I want to orient you with the different aspects of macros that we'll be talking about as we go through this tutor tutorial series, and that you need to make decisions on for yourself. Like, where will I put my macros? What will I put in a token? What will I make globally accessible? So, let's look at these panels over here. We're going to start on the far right with global. Global macros are in map tool itself. So no matter what campaign I load, as long as I'm on my instance of map tool, I will always see these, which is why I have general big picture macros over here, such as GM die rolls and public die rolls. I don't have anything very specific. Only you can see these on your copy of map tool. This is good and bad. I used to only put macros I wanted to see in here, but it was messy and I had macros in games I didn't need them in. So for a while I was running Numenera and Pathfinder, and so I had to deal with different macros and figure out how to organize them. And so I ended up abandoning that uh, idea of keeping hidden macros here, and I put them in the campaign. Now campaign macros are saved in the campaign file. So this campaign file here is Numenera Map Tool Tutorial. I have this saved, so no matter what, when I open this, I'll always see these campaign uh, macros here. You can select when you start a server to have these campaign macros hidden or visible to players, and it depends on what you need them for. I personally keep my campaign macros hidden from players when I do play online, but that's because none of my campaign macros that I've created are ones that players would use. Our next column here in this where it says selection right now is actually the token area. So when I select a token, it selects here and it shows me all the macros on that hero. These are saved within each specific token and can only be used with that token. And again, this is viewed on the selection tab. And what would happen is if I copied this hero and made another one and selected both of them, they would both show up on here and it would display common macros. Now, before we get too far, I'd like to let you know that it is possible to copy macros and export them. 
uh, and import them in, especially into another token or even into another set of campaign or global uh, macros. So if I said this export macro set, and then I went to my desktop and I put upload, let's just call it that for now. And then I were to copy this guy and I were to clear all the macros, I could right click import macro set and import that macro. I can do this with individual macros too. So for example, I could uh, export this entire macro set from this campaign and email it to someone. Now these panels show, as I've said, global campaign and uh, selection of the token that you have. There's one more aspect, and I'm going to show it with window. I'm going to open my impersonate window. And what this allows me to do is when I select a token, I can impersonate the selected token, and it shows me everything here. Now what's going to happen if I just clicked to attack here, it would show that the hero, I attack the darkness and all that stuff. If I click it over here, it will still show the same output. What changes a little bit though, is that when I type in the chat now, I can speak as the hero. And when it outputs it, it acts as the hero speaking. To end an impersonation, it's this little red X right next to where it says speaking as hero. You click X on that and you return to your GM control. Our next step that I'm going to talk to you about is right-clicking in these panels. I'm going to get rid of this impersonate because I'm not going to use it right now. Now, right-clicking depends on where you right-click. So I have this selection of this hero token. So if I right-click here, it allows me to add new macros and things like that. Clear the group. Be careful on that one. Uh, if I right-click on the macro itself, I get different things. So I could duplicate it, reset, delete export this one specific macro or run this for each selected. Now this would be more if you have a global uh, macro that say like attack and then you could circle every token that you want to attack and just click click it and it'll run for each of those macros or I'm sorry each of those tokens. Now editing and organizing these macros we're going to talk about what's inside the macro itself. So I'm going to come up here to this hero attack macro and click edit and it's gonna open another window. And this is where all the stuff that you need to input to the macro goes. So let's start here. Label is just the name that goes on the macro. So each of these macros with a name, that's just its label. Next, you can assign a group to it. So if I look over here under my campaign where I've got a lot of different groups, you can see I have Dungeon Fun here, GM Intrusions here. Each one of these has, each one of these macros has this group name. And what'll happen, for example, if I right click on the speed and I click duplicate, it will duplicate that speed macro in this GM intrusion category. I don't have to start from scratch each time when, uh, when trying to group everything. If I go back to my attack macro, I also have sort prefix. So if you add a prefix to these, as you can see over here, like on Dungeon Fun, this automatically defaults to alphabetical order. You could change the order by putting the sort prefix here, or you can also just change it the way I did down here because that's just how my brain works, where I just numbered each of these so I see them in the order that I want them to be. The last thing along the top is the hotkey. So if I were to click this and push, click F2 and hit OK, now when I hit F2, it automatically runs that macro when this token is selected. I don't tend to use that that often, but some people may like that, especially your players if you're playing a uh, die rolling heavy game and they're always, for example, using their great sword. Next we have the command area. The command area is where you actually put in the code for your macro. This is where everything is executed. And we'll get into more into that later. Include label, when you click this and hit okay, when I roll the attack, two things will happen. First off, it'll say the hero is using the attack macro, and then it'll come out with the output. I find that to be too much. I don't tend to use that. Auto-execute, these macros default to auto-execute. If I unselected it, deselected it, and clicked it again, you'll see that down here in my chat window, it dumps all the code from the macro itself, and then I have to hit enter for it to run. Again, I don't really like to do that, so I keep that auto-executed. 
and apply to selected tokens. So if you wanted this attack to pull uh, properties from the token properties of a bunch of different tokens, you could select that and it would run it for all of them. These next two columns here deal with how the button itself will look. So if I look over here at my clear chat button or my GM intrusion buttons, I've changed the color of the button uh, here, and then I've changed the font color to white with this one. And then I could change the font size if I wanted to, the minimum width that I want it to be, maximum width, and this tooltip. So right now I have a tooltip on this attack macro that says click to attack. So if I click OK, right now the macro itself says attack, but if I hover over it, a tooltip appears that says click to attack. Your option, it's up to you. There's one final tab under macros where you can mess with some other aspects here. Um, these all come defaulted, uh, selected, and I've never really done much with these. So I'm not gonna speak a lot to these. I've never had to change them. The uh, program works fine without me messing with them and I've never looked into them. So if you want to look into them more, you can check out some of the documentation online to see what they do. So for now, that's it. I'm gonna get started on the next video where we actually create some of our first macros. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you soon.